In this video, we will conclude our discussion of the generic risk assessment process. In this part three of three parts, we will address how element ratings are aggregated upward into probability, consequence, and risk ratings. By now, you have identified the risk, decomposed it into its component parts, gathered the best available evidence on these elements, and use that evidence to assign ratings to each of your consequence and probability elements. Now it is time to begin to characterize the risk you identified. Let's continue to use the Glimmers example to think about this a little more carefully. We'll use the risk of the silver carp to the Great Lakes Basin as our example. Before we go on, take a moment to consider how the generic process we are working on is consistent with the generic risk assessment model introduced earlier in the course. We have identified the hazard as Asian carp. The consequences are economic, environmental, social, and political. You have seen the sequence of five steps that comprises the likelihood assessment. And now we will see how all of this is pulled together in a risk characterization. And remember, we're doing this in the first place because risk managers identified aquatic nuisance species as a significant problem to be solved. Here is one of the many risk assessments done for silver carp. You don't have to worry about the details of how many were done and which we've chosen. We're just going to use this as a learning device. In column 1, you see the probability and consequence elements listed. Column 2 provides the evidence-based rating for each element. The third column shows the uncertainty rating that accompanies the element rating. Notice the amber cells identify missing elements of the generic process. Our goal is to learn how to provide these. Let's look at how you calculate the overall probability of establishment using the values shown in this table. Remember, our algebraic formulation of this problem is the product shown here. A quantitative assessment of the probability is always going to be preferred when it's available, but it is not available in this case. We do, however, want our qualitative probability assessment to mimic the qualities of a quantitative assessment as much as is possible. To gain some insight into how best to do that, let's substitute some numbers for the qualitative assessment values. Let a high probability equal 0.9 and a low probability equal 0.1. You could use any values you want here, but these will do for our purposes. The general equation now becomes very specific as shown here. It is 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.1 times 0.9 times 0.9. That is four high probability values times a single low probability value. Let's do the math. The overall probability of establishment is 0.066. This is lower than any one of the values in the equation above. The overall probability is always going to be less than the lowest value unless one of those values is 0 or all of the values are 1. That is an inevitable result of multiplying a series of numbers, each of which is between 0 and 1. For any series of multiplicative probability values, such as the one shown here, the rule for combining probability ratings is that the overall probability of establishment equals the rating of the lowest rated probability element. In the example shown here, four high rated elements and one low rated element yield a low overall probability of establishment. This will seem counterintuitive to people who have not thought carefully about how the numerical calculations work. So be prepared for people to object to this method. In fact, if we applied the logic of numbers, we know the overall probability of establishment is actually lower than the lowest rated element. 
so the rule we use may actually overstate the probability at times. Let me illustrate with an example. Suppose we had five high probability ratings. Note that 0.9 raised to the fifth power equals 0.59. So five high probabilities multiplied together may actually produce a medium probability. Thus calling H H H H H a high probability may well be overstating the probability of the consequences. Aggregating consequences is not quite so straightforward. Here you see the three categories of consequences. Mathematics does not help us here because the units of measure for the different consequences are often impossible to combine in a simple manner. In this case, where all three consequences are high, it is evident that the overall consequences are high. But what if they are not all high rated consequences? The overall consequence rating for the Glimris study is determined by using this lookup table. Consequence Scenario 1 is based on the value judgment of the risk managers that if the environmental consequences are high, it does not matter what the other consequence ratings are. The overall consequences will be high. Notice that environmental equal to H, economics equal to L, and social political equal to L leads to the same overall rating as environmental equals H, economics equals H, and social political equals H. That is not a natural conclusion. It reflects the value judgment of risk managers who weigh the relative importance of the consequences. For practice, take a look at the table and see what an MLM rating would result in. The last step in the risk characterization is to assign an overall risk rating based on the consequence rating and the probability rating. For this example, we'll use the four ratings you see here, high, medium, low, and none. We'll use these for both risk components. What we want to do is develop a risk matrix, as we discussed earlier in the course. Let's begin with the easy stuff. Any risk that has none as one of its components is going to have no risk potential. Let's color these cells green. We know the greatest risk potential is when probability and consequences are both high. Let's color that cell red. That part was easy. What about the rest of these cells? Well, to begin, we can ask do we think we have two gradations here or one? Now I believe a high medium risk is in a different class than a low low risk, so I want to see two gradations here. I also want to comply with the Cox conditions for risk matrices, so the final coloring is easy for me. Now let's label the overall risk potential from high to none. All that remains in the process is to assign the overall risk potential. Recall that the silver carp would have high consequences if they became established, but they had a low probability of establishment. This combination would land them here in a yellow cell with low risk potential. Before we leave this topic behind, let's consider an alternate coloring of the risk matrix just to stress the importance of coloring one last time. Imagine that the owner and risk manager in chief decided that these colors reflected his risk preferences. Cox in his 2008 article said that ideally a qualitative risk matrix approximates a quantitative risk matrix such that a high qualitative matrix risk score represents in reality a quantitatively higher risk than a low matrix risk score. He uses the term weak consistency to describe this underlying conformity between the qualitative risk matrix and an underlying quantitative model. 
To help you envision this underlying model, I have assigned a 3 to high, a 2 to medium, a 1 to low, and a 0 to none, and completed the multiplication for the cells as you see here. The numbers in the cells now represent an underlying quantitative model. To meet this goal of weak consistency, the structure of the risk matrix should follow certain rules. An example of such a rule is that no high risk cell in the risk matrix should touch a low risk cell because it would represent a discontinuous jump in risk as opposed to the progressive increase in risk one would expect with a quantitative model. Similarly, Cox argues that a risk matrix satisfying weak consistency will have low risk in all cells in the bottom row and low risk in all cells on the leftmost column. The risk matrix shown in the previous slide conforms to Cox's rules of weak consistency. This matrix does not. One upshot of this is that scarce risk management resources may be misallocated. In this example, a high low risk is rated low overall, while a low high risk is rated as medium. This could result in too many resources going to manage one risk or too few resources going to manage the other risk. Many fields of practice have well-developed risk assessment models. If you are fortunate enough to work for one of them, by all means learn and use their models. There are so many new fields, new organizations, and new applications for risk assessment that specific application models simply can't keep up with the demand. That makes this generic model an incredibly versatile and useful option for risk managers. Now that you're finished, have a try at Generic Jeopardy! And if you have any questions, let me know in class.